All right, guys, this is Dr. Brian Mann coming at you uh, from the University of Miami. Uh, in one of two of my classes, actually, this week, uh, we went over one of the grad and one of the undergrad. We went over this study. Uh, it was dealing with biomechanical specificity is the reason why we went over it. Uh, this is one of my favorite studies on this. Uh, some of it because it kind of challenges the status quo, but it also supports a lot of the Soviets in German literature about the, uh, the angle specificity. Uh, this title is Joint Angle Specific Strength Adaptations Influence Improvements in Power in Highly Trained Athletes. Now, one of the other things that is very, very unique about this paper is the authors. Now, we have two NFL strength coaches on here. Uh, we've got then Matt Ray, of course, uh, that we mentioned the other day, who was the director of sports science for the football team at University of Alabama. And uh, unfortunately, I, I don't know a lot of the other authors on here personally, but to see that, hey, there's two NFL strength coaches on here, well, man, you know, that, that's saying something. Because uh, for the practicality of the study design, do a lot of times that there's some people who are very, very smart with research but they don't understand sport, and then they get frustrated and, and other things because sport is dirty. So with this, we understand and we get everything, right? So we, we're going to get some context that we might not get in other circumstances, having uh, the additional authors on here. Now, the purpose of this study was to examine the influence of training at different ranges of motion during the squat exercise, a joint angle-specific strength adaptations. Now, what were those joint angle-specific strength adaptations? Well, they were looking at how it transferred to the sprints and to the jump. Now, first things first, let's go over the baseline data. Now, we remember that uh, if you look back and you think about everything from Tutabampa, he would say that uh, all strengths relate back to absolute strength, and that's true for a while. And uh, there's been some studies coming out that show uh, you know, where the results kind of tra you know, taper off on, on strength and, and the like. If we look at their body weight and their pre-full squat 1RM, we see that everybody here basically squats one and a half times body weight. So they're not weak individuals. We look at their age and realize that these are college athletes. Well, these are, uh, and they were, they were junior college and, uh, and lower level uh, divisions. And for the athletes there, so why were they? Why did they choose to use those? Well, because that's who was available. Uh, everybody's at a one and a half times body weight squat. We look and we see that there's not a significant difference between their pre's on the vertical jump and their pre on the forty. And it might be a little bit of one between the quarter and the full, but uh, the changes come out pretty interesting, and that makes it even more interesting later. So they did. Uh, we could see that they did test the pre-quarter squat, one or the, they pre-tested quarter squat, half squat, and full squat for this. To look and see how the joint angle, uh, the specificity popped up, and seeing how the different squats related to each other. Now, I wanted to go over this. Now, this chart shows basically, hey, you know, if you're at a strength deficit, strength association, or if you have a strength reserve, you know, wh at what point do we see these different adaptations? And everybody here is about a 1.5. Uh, so they have seen a humongous improvement in their squat strength uh, to, you know, showing that basically, hey, man, these guys are getting some great benefits, supposedly. Now, let's look and see what happened to the changes. Well, we know that this light circle is the quarter squat group, this dark square is the half squat group, and the triangle is the full squat group. And the quarter squat, it, this goes back to specificity, guys, right? So whatever the squat depth that you did, that's going to be the one that you improved the most on. It's like if I do uh, a tremendous amount of bench press, what's going to happen to my overhead press? What's going to happen to my row? Don't know. Uh, they're probably not going to go up much if you didn't train those. If you're counting on your bench press to make your row go better or your bench press to make your overhead press go better, uh, you, know, you might see some slight improvements, as they saw here. Uh, but in the untrained, you, you don't see a, a tremendous amount. 
Now, full squat, though, was kind of interesting because the full squat got a lot better. The half squat got a little bit better, but the quarter squat, I flipped that. I'm sorry. The quarter squat got a little bit better, but the half squat really didn't improve much. Okay. Uh, but the full squat saw the most improvement. And as we see on each of these, if you did the quarter squat, quarter squat got the biggest improvement. You did the half squat, the half squat got the biggest improvement. If you did the full squat, the full squat got the biggest improvement. Well, that's no surprise there. But well, let's look at the absolute change to the vertical jump. So with the vertical jump, we see that, hey, the quarter squat had the biggest improvement in the vertical jump, followed by the half squat, and then finally the full squat. So we see that, hey, man, full squat did see a significant improvement. So it's not saying that it didn't work. Okay? Uh, it's just is saying that it didn't work uh, as well as some others. We look at the change to the sprint. And remember, so we're looking at, if you look at the left, you'll see that that is sprint time, and that's not velocity. So that's time in seconds. So when we see a significant decrease, that's actually a good thing, because that's meaning that they were able to complete the same distance run in a shorter amount of time, so they actually had a higher velocity. A lot of times when people look at studies, they would just look and be like, oh, they got slower. Well, no, they didn't. They didn't. They actually got quite a bit faster. Uh, so that we see that uh, pretty much the half squat and the full squat were significantly different than baseline. Uh, the full squat was not, but it was significantly different from the quarter squat, meaning that they didn't improve, and the quarter squat saw a massive improvement. So that's, uh, that's pretty interesting. Now, if we look at the percent changes uh, in the performance measures, uh, basically, whatever you... And this comes back to what we had just previously mentioned. That whatever you did the most of, that's where you saw your biggest improvement and the one that's going to be closest to it. So we see that uh, for the quarter squat, there's a little bit of improvement in the half squat and a very minor improvement in the full squat. The half squat, moderate improvement here in the quarter, good in the half, none in the full. And the full saw, hey, no improvement in the quarter squat. We saw improvement in the half. We saw improvement in the full. Now, if we look at the vertical jump, okay, uh, we see that they went up, the quarter squat went up about 15%. The half squat went up 7%. And the full improved by about 1%. Now, the 40, they saw an improvement of about 2% in the quarter squat. And the half squat about a 1%, and the full is short of 0%. But now with the sprint, we need to go ahead and, and, and apply a little bit of context here. Uh, whenever somebody is highly trained, to see a, a improvement in the sprint, it, it doesn't take much, right? Uh, I believe that it was a study that uh, Jerry Mayhew, myself, uh, put out with a few other uh, co-authors looking at smallest worthwhile change in the different sprints. And it was either 0.01 or 0.02 was what was found to be the smallest worthwhile change. So if somebody, this is 0, 0.00, but they saw the smallest worthwhile change, and also it's not just football guys, it's not, or not just football that happened at University of Missouri uh, whenever I was there for so long. This is pretty standard uh, across everything. Because you think about sprinters, and if they see a 0.01, that's a massive improvement, and people will, uh, be dancing and partying for a week for an improvement like that, or for a full year of training. So you know, the the percent changes here might be, and that makes the quarter and half even more massive uh, as a result. But that's to say that the the full, while it didn't see any percentage changes, it very well might have seen met the smallest worthwhile change. Now we look at the effect size. Now sometimes people struggle with this if you're not really familiar with effect sizes, and I think this was Cohen's D. But a, a significance, all significance says is that, hey, the differences here were less than 5% likely due to chance, uh, that, so that there's a real difference. Now, it doesn't say that, it doesn't give us anything to the magnitude. You know, maybe it's a 0 .002, and that's statistically significant. Well, but it could be uh, clinically meaningless. So one of the things that people have done is to use effect sizes. An effect size basically is the magnitude of change. Okay? Uh, 
Uh, and it, with Cohen D, I think it's point two is small, point four, point five is moderate, uh, and points uh, it's either point seven or point eight is uh, is large. So you know, any time, so that just gives us some frame of reference here, and that actually makes our uh, squat look a little bit better uh, versus the previous slide with the percent changes. So for the effect size, for well. Again, for the lifts themselves, the movement that was trained is going to have the biggest effect size. So we see a 1.41, well, that's a massive effect size. A 1.76, that's even better than the quarter. 1.14, that's still a massive effect size. And we look that, hey, man, we got a moderate effect size for the half squat from doing the quarter, uh, small for the full. Uh, for the half squat, man, we got a, a large effect size for the quarter. Massive for the half, very low on the full, little school, not even worth talking about. Uh, and on the full squat, hey man, 0 0.05, 0 0.52, 1 1.00. So we see that we've got the, oh, that's a coefficient transfer, 0 0.05, 0 0.59, 1.14. Now let's look at the vertical jump in the sprint. Okay, the vertical jump, 0.75, so that's knocking on the door of large if large is 0.8. I mean, that's, that's huge. 0.48 for the half squat, 0 0.07 for the uh, full squat. Now, with the 40, negative 0.58, negative 0.35, negative 0.10, so that we see, hey, man, quarter squat did best for the 40 and for the vertical. Now, I just recorded a video for the transfer, so go. I recommend that you look at the transfer uh, training, uh, the transference index. Uh, to you know, to go deep on that, but 1.0 would be a perfect transfer okay, because it is the result in the non-trained by the trained. Well, dude, this was the train, this was the train, this was the train. So of course it's going to have a 1.0. But then we see the transfer uh, over to the half squat into the full. So we can see that hey man, everything has an impact on everything else. It obviously does. Whenever we look over towards the vertical jump. We saw 0.53, that's a that's a pretty good transfer. Uh, 0.28, that's nothing to sneeze at. 0.06, hey, man, there, it definitely has an impact for the full squat. Not as much as the half and not as much as the vertical. Then we look at the 40. Negative 0.41, it's the biggest. Negative 0.2, negative 0.09. So what we see here is that the 40 and vertical definitely improve as a result of doing quarter and half squats by doing the restricted range of motion. Now, if we th stop and we think about it, why? Well, if you st stood up right now and you went to do a vertical jump, oh, oh wait, so stand up from your desk or your, your laptop or wherever. Hopefully you're not on a train because uh, it would suck to try and jump with a moving vehicle. Uh, but go ahead and stand up, jump up as high as you can. And land, do it again. Let's do it one more time. Okay, now stop when you get to the bottom. Do it again, but stop when you get to the bottom. And pay attention to where you, you are. You're a quarter or half squat. Even the people that have to wind up really long because of uh, their strategy to get maximum jump height, they're still not going to lower than a half squat. Think about whenever somebody's front foot makes contact with the ground on a sprint. What position are they in? Quarter squat or higher? So I think what we're looking at is joint angle specificity. So consistently including quarter squats and workouts aimed at maximizing speed and jumping power can result in greater improvements. Uh, in highly trained populations, there may be a greater need for specificity than in lesser trained populations. If your squat keeps going up, but your sprint and your jump performance doesn't, well, then it might be a time to include quarter squats and half squats. Now, that's not saying not to full squat, and in fact, I actually wrote an entire article for Simply Faster on squat depth periodization. And basically, you know, none of these authors tried to villainize the squat, even though a lot of people said, oh, you're saying squats are stupid. No, they, they never once said that. They even showed statistically that, hey, man, you know, there, there still is some improvement. It's just not as much. So whenever you get down to it, everything is beneficial just at different times. So if we're looking at a total periodization scheme and we were looking for improving the, everybody talks about individualization and specificity,
But if we're looking to take the squat and improve its specificity over the course of the year, well, after the anatomical adaptation phase, where you should be restoring your joint range of motion, uh, specifically to the ankle joint, because that seems to be a major limiting factor on the squat. How is the ankle joint a limiting factor on the squat? Uh, it's the ability to dorsiflex. Right? Uh, and if you can't dorsiflex, then you can't get squat depth without having to lean over or do something funky. Matter of fact, think about the functional movement screen. Whether you like it or not, think about the deep squat. What is their, number, what is their first correction for that to see for if somebody gets a two? Well, they elevate the heels. Well, what do they do? Well, they put you in plantar flexion, so they give you more available dorsiflexion. So after the anatomical adaptation phase, whenever the ankle is nice and mobile and all the joints are nice and mobile, you full squat. As you get closer and closer to the season, you start going into more and more specificity, you know, into the half and the quarter squats. Now, some of the positions might just need the full and the half squat based off of their uh, what they do. So if it's an offensive, defensive lineman, well, full squatting and half squatting might be ideal for them. And quarter squats might just be for in-season to reduce fatigue, but still train that movement. Uh, versus a basketball player, dude, I never see a basketball player do a full squat. I'm not saying in the weight room by any means. I'm saying on the court. So then, you know, that half and uh, quarter squat, after they full squat, well, they should probably be focusing in there as they move into the season. So that's just, you know, some a couple of the key takeaways here that I, I think are, are huge for this study. Uh, I think it's extremely well done. Some people disagree with me on that. Um, but I also want to take this as a time to tell you that, hey, man, everybody's got bias. Everybody's got a cognitive bias. You may not know that it's there or that why, you know, because it's a cognitive bias. It's keeping you from knowing that it's there. But if we know what our biases are, we can step back and reexamine and then move forward. So for me personally, my background was in powerlifting. So I looked at everything from, you know, squat and deadlift, cure everything. Well, they don't. There's a time for them to quit working. So you just have to pay attention to that sort of thing and see how to incorporate that in your program. If you like this, come join us at the U. Uh, we have an undergrad exercise physiology program. We have a master's uh, program that's strength and conditioning focused with myself and Brian Biagioli. Uh, coming here at the U, man, we've got some tremendous faculty. We've got, uh, uh, you know, I'm probably the, the worst one. Uh, Joe Signorelli, Brian Biagioli. Uh, Motaz El Tuki, Kevin Jacobs, Wes Smith, Arlette Perry, the list goes on and on. We've got some fantastic faculty members, and we'd love to have you here with us. Maybe, though, you're a professional, and you're just trying to improve your strength and conditioning knowledge. I keep saying this over and over again. We're in the, the last phases of uh, negotiations before this comes up onto the, uh, onto the website. We've got some online coaches education courses coming. Uh, I've got an eight-week certificate in strength and conditioning, and then we're also working on getting a choose-your-own-adventure. Uh, the choose-your-own-adventure is going to be, you know, just specific to what you want to know and not just general strength and conditioning. Uh, so, guys, that's it, man. Hey, you, you got questions. Uh, I don't claim to have all the answers, but I can answer what I, I can help. Uh, my social media, uh, at jbrianman. Most of you probably found this from social media, but just in case you didn't, my social media is at jbrianman, B-R-Y-A-N-M-A-N-N. -N -N. Uh, my email is just bman at miami.edu. Uh, we'd love to, have, uh, love to have you guys here. Hope all is well, and stay strong.